switches flood frames. And that's a good thing? Stick around in this video to find out why. As usual, let me set the context. These videos always follow the outline of my Cisco Press CCNA books. This video happens to match Volume 1, Part 2, Chapter 5's first section. You see the section titles from the book there on the left. However, in this video, I'm going to reverse the order versus the book and talk about flooding first, which is interesting because it turns out lands won't work without that. Then about MAC learning, and finally about forwarding when those MAC addresses are learned, which is far more efficient. As usual, stick around to the end of the video for a few extras. For instance, in this case, there's a question that crops up from time to time about today's topic. And I've gotten this over the years from different readers. And so I'll pose that to you. It's one that just makes you go, huh, I haven't thought about that. So I'll let you think about it, and then I'll revisit it in one of the activity videos. Speaking of that, I'll also tee you up with two different activity videos at the end of this video. Also, for you book readers, I'll talk about the book section and what you want to grab out of that and understand beyond what you see in this video. All right, let's dig into the details. To start, think about the endpoints connected to the LAN switch, like a PC or a laptop or something like that. It receives an Ethernet frame. The frame header and trailer and data looks like the format you see in the bottom of the slide. So what does it do? First off, it uses the frame check sequence at the end of the frame to determine if there were any bit errors in the frame during transmission. And if so, the Ethernet logic throws the frame away. It's up to other layers to do any error recovery if desired. But let's say the frame arrived and there were no bit errors. Then the receiver, the endpoint, says, hey, is the destination address a, quote, unicast address? That is, does it represent one device? And then is it my address? If it's a unicast address and it's me, then that host will process the frame. If it's a unicast address but it's not its address, it discards the frame. Now, you might think, why are you bothering telling me this? Well, it's very important to the process of allowing flooding to realize that hosts will simply discard things sent to it that aren't addressed to it, as described here. So now let's talk about what the switch does in this flooding idea. Say laptop one is going to send a frame, and say its destination unicast address is that of laptop number two. All right, so when the switch receives that frame, it, quote, floods the frame in this case, and I'll tell you when it might do that here in just a second. But let's just say it did. So flooding means this. It means forward the frame out all other ports except the, quote, arrival port. So the arrival port is gig 101 up in the upper left. The switch then floods the frame out the other three ports. So two, three, and four receive the frame. So we just talked about what the endpoints do when they receive a frame. Well, it's destined to a unicast address. Three and four see that it's not their destination address, so they discard the frame. PC2 says, oh, that is me in the destination address field. I will process the frame. All right, so that's how the endpoint logic accommodates this flooding process. The text on the slide right now summarizes the points and it expands a little bit talking about flooding. So the switch itself checks the frame check sequence as well. So a frame arrives in the switch, it discards it if it has bit errors, but if not, it checks the destination MAC address. And if the destination MAC address is not found in the switch's MAC address table, it floods the frame, as we just discussed. Also, if the destination MAC address is the broadcast address, that's the one with all hex Fs or foxes in the address, it always floods those. Additionally, and not written on the slide, is there are a third class of addresses called multicast addresses. And if you haven't configured any multicast optimizations, those are flooded as well. But that's a whole other topic that CCNA doesn't really get into, so I don't go into it here. So let's talk about that flooding process just a little bit more. Let's just say there's a unicast frame sent into this LAN, and we've got three switches in a row kind of in a linear fashion just to make a point, not that you would design a network with this topology. So here we see a frame coming in from some unshown device on the left. 
I don't care what the destination address is so much other than the fact that when it hits switch one, switch one does not have a matching Mac table entry. So switch one forwards out all of its ports that are connected to endpoints, but it also forwards out this port connected to switch two. Now, if switch two looks at the destination Mac address of that frame and its Mac table does not match the destination, it floods the frame. Now that's a completely independent decision from what switch one did. So each switch compares to its Mac table, makes its choice, no match, floods the frame, switch two forwards as well over to switch three. Switch three looks at its Mac table and as drawn, doesn't match the Mac table, so it floods the frame there. So there's an example of flooding where all three switches think of the frame as a quote, unknown unicast frame. And that's a term we use to describe a frame whose destination address is unknown to the respective switches. So just to go through a couple more, let's just say PC11 at the bottom left sends a frame. Switch A1 does not match the destination address, so it floods out the bottom right port and up to switch D1. Say D1 doesn't know about the MAC address in its table. D2 doesn't know about the MAC address. A2 doesn't know about the MAC address, so it forwards down to the other two. Now, why is that a good thing? I mentioned that in the intro, right? Well, let's say this frame was really meant for PC22. That's the destination address. Well, if PC22 is up and working, it gets a copy. It can reply, and we'll talk about MAC table learning here in just a second. So in the future, forwarding will be much more efficient. The other PCs that don't need this frame, they'll just discard it. So the host logic helps the flooding process in that flooding works. We reach the device and everybody else can ignore frames they don't really need to look at. All right, one last thing on what flooding does to the network. Let's consider a case in which there's redundancy between the switches, which is very common. When there's redundancy, you use spanning tree protocol or STP between the switches to avoid this next problem. Let's say we've got a frame and it's being flooded. Well, with the flooding logic we've talked about so far, say switch one forwards, then switch two forwards to switch three and switch three forwards to switch one. And similarly, we'd have a frame copy going around the other direction. And there's no mechanism in Ethernet to remove those from the network. They'd keep looping around in both directions until you consume all the link bandwidth with these frames being flooded around. It's called a broadcast storm or a forwarding storm, but more often a broadcast storm because broadcasts are flooded. So without STP, we've got all these looping frames. With STP, we thwart that by basically shutting down one port from the perspective of forwarding. Let's talk about the learning process, but the beginning point is the switch doesn't know anything to put in its MAC table. It's dynamically built. So there's an empty table. The table lists MAC address and the quote output interface or output port that the switch would use when forwarding to an address. All right. So that's what's there. And we haven't talked about VLANs, but there'll be a VLAN ID listed there as well. But stay tuned. I'll expand upon the MAC table concept when we talk about VLANs. All right, so that's the beginning point. So what gets learned? Well, when a frame comes in, learning will happen. And in this case, the forwarding, we already talked about it, right? In this case, the destination address won't be matched because the MAC table's in empty. So the frame gets flooded, as we just talked about. All right, let's talk about learning. Here's a list of what happens when learning happens. You can hit pause and read it, but I'm going to describe it with examples over the next few pages. I just wanted the words here for your uh, easier studying, studying, if you will. So let's walk through that same scenario again. PC1 sends that frame, and that's when learning happens. So if the frame passes the frame check sequence, the switch says, all right, there are no errors. Let me look not at the destination address, but the source address. Now it looks at both, but for the purpose of learning, it looks at the source MAC address. And it says, hey, I, I get that I need to forward this frame right now, but if I ever need to send something back to the source MAC address, it's obviously off of my port gig 101, right? So PC1's MAC address is listed in the diagram. We put that, I say we, the switch puts that in its table, and it also lists the port in which the frame arrived. So 
Frame comes in, source address is added, and the arrival port or source port is added to that entry. And that's what gets learned with Mac table learning or switch learning, if you will. All right, now let's just say PC2 was the PC for which this frame was destined. So it received the frame when it was flooded and PC2, of course, is sending some message back as we see here. So that frame will be forwarded with the forwarding logic, but for learning, the switch says, hey, the source Mac, what is it? It's the one that's got all those twos in it. So it adds a Mac table entry 0200 2222s and of course puts port gig 102. That is the port the frame arrived in there. So basically anytime a frame arrives, it's the source Mac that's added along with the arrival port that gets added to the table. So for PC three and four, you would see entries like those. So let's talk about switch forwarding a little bit more now with this idea of having some entries in the Mac table. There's always a check by the switch for the frame check sequence to see if there are errors or not. If the destination then is a unicast address, we see the logic there. We're going to forward based on the matching entry in the table if there's a match. Otherwise, we'll flood the frame, but broadcast frames are always flooded. That's step three in this summary. So let's see it in action. So here we're back to the same four PCs in the one switch, but with a completely full Mac table. And we have a bold entry, the second line, that matches PC2's Mac address. So if PC1 sends a frame with PC2's Mac as the destination, the switch forwards only up to PC2. It does not forward down below out ports three and four to PCs three and four. It's much more efficient. So flooding is good, right? Because it makes the LAN work. But flooding is a little bad because it's less efficient than what you just see here. So in a perfect world, the switch would quickly learn the Mac table entries, which it will. It'll forward based on those and the network works very efficiently. And should they ever go away, they'll be learned again very quickly and forwarding will be nice and efficient as we see here in this example. All right, so that's the basic part of it. But just for a few more examples here, Say PC11 is sending a frame to PC12. They're right beside each other in the figure in the lower left. What happens? Well, if all four switches have nice full MAC tables, like we see on the far right, switch A1's MAC table, and PC11 sends a frame destined for PC12, it comes in to switch A1, who turns around and forwards it right back down port two to PC12, and it doesn't even need to bother forwarding it up and around to the other three switches. They're not even bothered at all. Certainly the other two PCs are not bothered. However, if the destination say is PC 22 on the far right, so 11 to 22 in this case, well, the frames obviously got to go around the whole network, but as it comes into switch A1, it doesn't flood it, switch A1. It doesn't send it down to PC 12, but necessarily it's going to go through all the other switches and then be forwarded out the only port that it needs to be forwarded out, the one connected over to PC22. Now that we've gotten through the idea of flooding and forwarding, let's talk about some of those things I mentioned right up front in the video. If you own the books and you open the section from Volume 1, Chapter 5, the first section, Land Switching Concepts, you don't really have to. But that section does end with a great summary list of the logic of a land switch. So if you've got the book, that's a great list from which to study. So I recommend it, although all the concepts are covered here in the video. So two review activities this time. First, we've got a terminology mind map. If you're familiar with those, go for it. You can do it now, but it's best if you wait a day or two. Even better if you'll schedule it so you don't forget. And the seed term is land switching in this case. Now, if you don't know what a, what a term mind map is, I've got a video about that. It's in this same playlist so you can learn about how to do those. Second, we've got a new kind, at least new if you're watching these videos in the sequence of the playlist, and I call this an interview question. So you show up for a job interview, there's usually a technical interview, and you might sit in the room and get asked questions about networking in this case. So. You might see a diagram like this and be asked questions. So how do you do that here in the context of what I'm doing here on this video channel? Uh, you can do it right now, that's fine. But if you wait a day or two, that's even better. Scheduling it is better, but 
what do you do? All right. So to hear the questions from me, you've got to start the next video, the activity video. And it's going to be titled something like interview questions, land switching one, as you see there. So start it. And that will start out with showing you this same diagram again and asking questions of you, at which point you should pause the video and then answer, answer out loud. Um, write an answer. You could even post an answer on an online forum somewhere if you wanted. Finally, at the beginning of this video, I told you at the end, I would tell you about a question that comes up from time to time that is just kind of one of those ponderous things. Well, turns out people ask, what about the switch interfaces MAC addresses? They're Ethernet interfaces. They ought to have MAC addresses. Do the switches learn their own interface MAC addresses? Do they learn other switches interface MAC addresses? Which ones and why? We tend to focus on the endpoints connected to the switches, just like I did in this entire video. So you can ponder that. And as I promise to you, if you do the interview question activity, I will get around to talking about that toward the end of that video. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for hanging around till the very end, folks. You know the drill. Subscribe and click the bell if you're new to the channel and want more. And if you just want to let me know what you're thinking, leave me a comment, give me a like, share it online somewhere, tag me if you're on Twitter or LinkedIn. That's always appreciated. Hey, thanks for hanging out. I'll talk to you soon.